Welcome to Made in Mari, the podcast that focuses on the successes and struggles of local businesses. Let's get started. My name's G, I'm your host, and today I'm sitting down with Rob Wiggum, who is an artist and specifically a watercolor painter. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, G. How are you? Uh, I'm very well this morning. Firstly, tell us a little bit about the focus of your art. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, my, my art is pretty much landscape-based. Um, I'm motivated by I mean, just the beauty, which I can see out of the window at the moment, looking mm-hmm. down this uh, gorgeous coastline of ours. Um, so most of the focus of my art is landscape. Um, I am ex-military, um, so I do some military aircraft work as well. But even then, the military aircraft get set in their own landscape setting. Mm-hmm. So yeah, landscape is where it's at for me. And reasonably realistic too. It's a pretty interesting contrast, the the landscape and the military element. Because I've seen some of your pictures and you've got the beautiful Scottish coastal landscape and the the plains in there. So uh, how, what is it like contrasting those two things together? Well, it's, um, I mean, I, th- what's good for me is that um, having flown around the coastline quite mm-hmm. a lot in the past, um, I know what that coastline looks and feels like from the air and I know oh, what right. it feels like to be in that aeroplane. Um, which is why most of my aircraft are somewhere around the Murray Coast <laughs> or thereabouts. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean it's it, it's a different thing. They require different types of work, but to be honest, mm-hmm. the techniques are fairly similar. Um, mm-hmm. And what you've just got to do is to make sure that one complements the other, and the colours complement mm-hmm. each other, so that the whole thing looks like one whole. And it does. It looks so natural when I look at your pictures. It's Thank you. uh, it, it's very beautifully done. So, what was the inspiration for starting this artistic journey? I've always um, enjoyed art to some extent. Um, I I used to do a lot of pencil work when I was young um, and uh, kind of graduated into pen and ink, um, actually using a dip pen, which is what I enjoyed doing. Okay. Um, and a few years, well, probably more than a few years, probably 25 years back now, I mm-hmm. started getting the idea of putting some colour in and started watercolour. Um, and it was just a hobby back then. Um, but it grew from there, and uh, eventually I realised that uh, you know there's a, a potential business here. Mm-hmm. Did you ever have any of that experience with art when you were at school, younger? I did do art. Um, I um, stopped having done O level. Um, mm-hmm. That's the precursor to GCSEs. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I did. I did that, um, but then pretty much dropped it because uh, where I went on from there was science based. Mm-hmm. So my education from there was all science based, uh-huh. and uh, that was where a lot of my interest lies. But to be honest, there's a lot more interplay between science and art than you think. Mm-hmm. So, well, when was the initial point? that you, you picked up a brush and you started doing the painting? Because there was, you know, you, you mentioned a break when you didn't get art at school. And so there must have been some point later on where you picked up something and said, ah, I'll try this. Yeah, I mean, like I say, I was, I was interested in exploring colour a little bit as mm-hmm. opposed to just line. Um, and uh, yeah, I tried it. I, brought a, I bought a, uh, a basic watercolour set, mm-hmm. um, had a go at it and thought, wow, mm-hmm. that's difficult. <laughs> um, watercolour is difficult to control because of the way it goes on wet, mm. you know, and the colours can run into each other, which mm. is part of its strength. But when you're learning it, it's part of its difficulty. <laughs> um, and yeah. I used to, um, because I used to only paint when I had periods of holiday or leave, um, I could feel myself improving during the, the mm-hmm. time that I was painting. Mm-hmm. But then I'd go back to work and it would be a few months before I went back to it. Um, mm-hmm. And I'd come back after a few months and I'd be starting at the bottom again. So actually, it's good to be in a business, you know, where I paint literally pretty much every day. Wow. What are the typical tasks that an artist has to do on a daily basis? Um, there's there's preparation work and there's a, the actual painting work. Um, some of the preparation would be, um, you know, for example, you have to stretch the paper before you use it, which sounds very strange. It's just a, a matter of getting it very wet. 
okay. pinning it down at the edges and then letting it dry so it tries to shrink but can't. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that when you paint on wet paper, it doesn't wrinkle like uh, you might expect paper to wrinkle when you got it wet. Uh -huh. um, so there's that sort of basic element. The other one is sketching because mm -hmm. I'm a big believer that you can't, you can't really be an artist as I feel an artist mm -hmm. to be if you don't get out there and sketch the real world. So mm -hmm. I spend a lot of my time just sketchbook in my pocket, wandering mm -hmm. up and down the coast, finding something that looks good, sketching it. Um, it keeps your skills going. It also brings out some really great ideas that you can develop later on into a painting. And then, of course, there's the actual painting too. Mm. Did you ever envision a time when you would become an artist and sell your work? I can say that um, I was going to leave the REF, which is my previous career, mm -hmm. um, at age 38, and as a, which is a pretty normal point to leave. Um, as it happens in the long run, the, the Air Force made me a better offer and I stayed on for another uh, eight years after that. But um, <clears throat> the main thing that I thought at the time was I had this dream that I was going to, A, come back to Northern Scotland because this is where we wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I wasn't. And we were going to buy a house. I was going to have a studio, perhaps sell some work. Um, but it's a pretty daunting prospect, and you've got to be sure that you can make that work, especially mm -hmm. at that stage in your life with young children and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end, I wasn't brave enough. Um, <laughs> but here I am after you know a few years later. Yeah. Well, what was the difference then? You say that you weren't brave enough before, but maybe now you are. What changed? Well, um, I mean, part of it is that, I, you know, I'm, I'm more, shall we say, mature. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm a little bit further down the line now. Uh, mm -hmm. I have, um, uh, you know, the, the children are, are grown up mm -hmm. and pretty much left home, etc. Um, and I'm now in a position where I can, uh, you know, work and rely more just for ourselves. And as you probably know from looking through uh, our material here, that, mm -hmm. you know, my wife is involved now as a partner as well. So it is in every true sense a family business. Mm -hmm. But we can afford to do that now because mm -hmm. we've got some backup behind us. So that's interesting. How do you divide up the tasks when your wife is a partner? <clears throat> uh, well, she's my manager. Right. Um, she, she, to start off, she's a lot cleverer than I am. Um, and that means that, um, you know, she is across pretty much everything that's going on. Mm. Because one of the things with an art business, it's not just painting pretty pictures. Mm. You have to be in the market for advertising yourself by mm. whatever mechanism you might do that. Um, we've got to get the work in front of the public, which means booking engagements, um, going to events and so on, which um, Sharon handles all of that. Mm -hmm. She also does a lot of the mechanical stuff that's behind this. For example, um, I mean, she's uh, the the one that looks after our print stocks. Okay. I'll produce the original material, but after mm -hmm. that, she makes sure that we're all fully stocked and everything's where it should be. Do you think a lot of artists might fail simply because they don't have that business side organized? I think that's quite possible to do, yeah. Um, it's important because, um, like I say, it... it you can paint a, a nice picture, um, but if you don't actually get it out there to the public, if you mm -hmm. can't get it in front of the person who wants to buy it, yeah. then it's not going to get sold. And that, at the end of the day, if it's a business, that's the important part. So how do you do that? How do you get your art out to the world? Well, um, these days, um, what the, the method that I've used is um, to use the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and we started out by setting ourselves up a website um, which we administer ourselves. Um, and the whole idea about that is just to get the pictures out there. And that gets a worldwide audience. Mm. Um, we also use social media a lot. Um, mm. Because, again, social media gives that worldwide audience. Um, you know, we're talking on an everyday basis with people mm. from Australia, from America, from Canada. Um, and, indeed, a lot of my pictures go out, uh, go out there. And how... Exactly. Do you use social media? What information do you put on there? Well, what we try to do, obviously, is to put the paintings out there mm -hmm. uh, and the prints. Um, sometimes um, what uh, Sharon will do is she'll make like a post which contains a collection of, of prints along a particular theme. Uh -huh. For example, Port Soy. 
mm-hmm. which might be one place that we'd like theme on because yeah. we've got several no, several paintings of Port Soy mm-hmm. um, and it makes for a nice picture. But also the public are sometimes quite interested in actually how you do business as an artist and part mm-hmm. of your daily life and so on. So we also mm-hmm. put on, you know, all about something about the procedure and I'm probably quite famous for putting myself out there on mm-hmm. posts and looking very, very windswept on some <laughs> headland somewhere at minus 20. Uh, because that's what I like to do. It gets me in touch. Yeah, the the methodology is very interesting to people. You know, the whole process of yeah. how the art is created. And also people might buy into the person as much as the art. I think there's a lot of that. You know, I think that um, you need to you need to come across as personable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I hope that, you know, I hope that we both are. I mean, Sharon's a really great strength with that because she's just great at talking to people and people like her. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, artists in all areas, whether it's painting or music, that have problems promoting themselves and they, they need someone to step in and help them and show them the way. I yeah. think. And then the artist can focus on the art, yeah, which is really what they need to do. So how do you find the subjects for your paintings? I, I wander up and down the coast a lot. And our, our, our painting range now goes from pretty much, uh, I think it's Nairn, heading east all the way across to Gardenstown, Gamery area. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so that's my stamping ground. I tend to wander up and down there finding things that motivate me. And I have to say, mm-hmm. a glance through my portfolio would say that mm-hmm. harbours motivate me a lot, so mm-hmm. do rocks. Um, mm-hmm. So those seaside views are good for me. I also go inland, of course, mm-hmm. um, and I just like to find views that, that suddenly strike a chord, you know? And I, I can't, or I can, but I find it hard to paint something that hasn't struck a chord. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you have to work at getting that chord struck. You know, you have to learn to love something, mm-hmm. especially on commission work. But then you yeah. can put your feeling into it. So what's that difference for you between the art that you want to paint and the commissioned work? Well, um, I mean, the stuff that I want to paint just comes from within me. And I've always got a half a dozen scenes that I know that I want to do next. Mm-hmm. Um, my next one is going to be crivy when I get time to do that because I've got a view there. I've got all the sketch work done for it. I'm just dying to get on and do that. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, uh, In terms of the commission work, well, that comes in. And sometimes people want views that I've either painted before mm-hmm. or an immediate view that you think, wow, that is just fantastic and I really enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's more difficult. You know, the view might be something that you don't like. Um, it might be difficult to really get behind, but the key to me is to try and find out what it is that the person likes about that view. And once you get that connection, you can then start to actually put some soul into it. Mm -hmm. Would it happen that you're out somewhere with your family or friends and you see some view and you're like, oh my God, I have to do something? All the time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The family are used to, um, you know, uh, in the car, perhaps um, the brake lights coming on (laughs) um, and me parking up somewhere. Uh, When we're out walking, yeah, Mm. it's all the time. That view is just fantastic. Hang on, Mm. I've got to sketch that. So, and, what, and what do people do when, when you say, like, wait, okay, guys, wait, i got to get my book out? Sharon takes her knitting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so she's prepared. She is, and oh. she's perfectly used to it. The only thing that mm-hmm. she um, generally doesn't like to do is to sit around in the bad weather. Mm. Um, so if the weather's that bad, then generally she would generally stay in the car. Yeah, that makes uh, perfect sense. So with your art, is it a situation where you're painting every day? Not every day, no. Mm -hmm. Um, And like I say, I I need to be out there sketching, finding views um, and doing all that sort of stuff. But the other Mm -hmm. side of it is that actually painting every day is pretty tiring. Um, And, you know, I've (laughs) Sharon used to be a nurse doing 12-hour night shifts. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty hard for somebody like me to say, well, I've been painting for four hours now and I'm a bit tired. Mm -hmm. Um, So... You can't really sell it like that. But in terms of the actual act of creation, it can leave you feeling a little bit drained. Um, So I tend to find that working every day is something that I do if I really have to, like if I've got a lot of commission load on at any one time. Um, But I try not to. When it's easy going, I'd like to do painting one day, sketching, getting out, getting Mm -hmm. away from the painting the next. 
And how do you stay motivated and inspired to continually do the work? It's a good question. Um, I don't really have the fan- have a fantastic answer to you um, yeah. because I am motivated all the time and it mm-hmm. comes from inside me. I, I guess a lot of it comes from the area that I live in. Um, mm-hmm. other we live in it's beautiful mm-hmm. um, and there is always more views out there than I can actually have time to paint so I have to prioritize so I guess you could say that the views that I want to paint I really want to paint yeah it makes sense how do you define success within the work that you do I think that's if people really like the, the work and and specifically of course if they like it enough that they want to buy it Mm-hmm. Um, it's easy to lose sight of that you know you want to um, it's easy to get hung up if you've got a lot of commission work on it's easy to think oh great I'm still on track with the commission so mm-hmm. I can get them finished in time and so on but what really counts in this business it's a, is, it's a visual art and I mm-hmm. want people to connect with the work um, so success for me is when they like it they want to buy it and that's it they want to buy it and at that point you know that yeah I've really touched this person with this work now Mm-hmm. Is there a way of knowing or understanding what it is that will sell or what it is that people will like? What I would say is that, um, and I learned this from experience, um, is that your painting has to be of something. Mm-hmm. Because um, you can paint a very pretty view and you can paint that patch of trees or you can paint that sunset. But if the painting isn't something that people can really connect with, Mm -hmm. it's likely to hang around and Mm -hmm. not sell. Um, Whereas if you can paint that sunset, Mm -hmm. but put it over that small village that people love, Mm -hmm. then the chances are you're going to succeed with that. So I do a bit of both because it's not all just purely about business. Um, Mm -hmm. You've got to do what you want to do to some extent. Mm -hmm. But what I try to do wherever possible is to work in that that specific focus of a painting and that generally is what makes it so how do you know if a work is finished (laughs) the standard technique is that it's not quite as good as it was two minutes ago Um, (laughs) it's it's getting it's getting worse (laughs) yeah i mean uh it's it is very difficult to know where to finish and um Mm -hmm. i adopt something that i call the 80 percent rule Mm -hmm. um and that's purely my own invention but what i like to do is i like to finish a painting when i think i'm finished 80 percent of any bit of it um because Mm -hmm. if you go on to 100 Mm percent it becomes too detailed it becomes too careful and you Mm -hmm. lose the life and spontaneity and yeah. life and spontaneity is what gives the painting some personality. Yeah. So I like to capture what I want to capture. And that it's an act of self-discipline to say, right, leave that bit. That's where you want it. Again, it makes perfect sense. For artists, do you think that qualifications and studying the art in, say, a university matters? Ah... Well, obviously, um, as a, um, a completely self-taught artist with no qualifications apart from a, um, I think it was a B grade at O level, mm-hmm. um, then uh, you might expect me to say no. And to a large extent, I think that you don't necessarily need these qualifications. I think a feeling and a, a, a need inside yourself to paint yeah. and some degree of technique um, and something that you've learned yourself is quite important. I wouldn't say that you don't need qualifications. I mean, mm-hmm. Qualifications will help in terms of you've been exposed to probably mm-hmm. more techniques than I have, um, a little bit more about the history of the uh, genre. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, obviously you'll have a lot more chance to practice, um, which would put somebody ahead of me than uh, you know, if they'd have been to university studying art, and obviously I didn't. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it would be helpful. In my Mm -hmm. case, I have no real qualifications to speak of. Mm. Did you have a teacher at all? Um, No, um, I'm I'm self-taught. I mean, I learned to um, paint by going out and buying the ABC of painting book Uh um, and uh, learned the basics from that. And, of course, um, did I have a teacher? Yeah, I did, in that, probably one of the best ways to learn to paint is to copy the masters Mm. you know people who've been there before and have really mastered the medium and it's quite a a frustrating experience because you find that you're (laughs) nowhere near as good but the idea is to improve 
And, and copying somebody else's work is fine as long as you're not going to pretend that it's your own work. Um, so, yeah, everybody learns like that. And what I did at a very early stage was I thought that, you know, all these things are trying to guide me into somebody else's style. And I don't want somebody else's style. My style needs to be my own. Mm. So um, I made a conscious decision really quite early on in my painting career when I was still doing it as a hobby that I was going to do it purely on my own. Um, so everything that you see in my paintings has come from myself effectively mm -hmm. and I've worked out how I want to present some things um, and I'm actually intensely proud of that because I know that this is nobody else's technique this is my own technique and I just apply it to everything that I do What was it like to sell the first piece of art that you sold? <laughs> it was a great feeling um, and I used to um, uh, paint a lot and, uh, you know, when I was doing well, they were reasonably good pieces, um, but I would give them away and I'd give them to friends. And, uh, of course, that's great. You know, that's, that's, I guess, how most people start. You've only got yeah. so much wall space in your own house. Right. Um, and we had some on the wall as well. Um, but it's a different thing when you're painting with a decision, with the idea that you're going to sell. Um, and at, the po at some point, um, I said and Sharon was still working at this stage um, rather than in partnership with me. But um, at some point I said, right, I'm going to call myself a professional artist at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and the first sale that you make from that is a fantastic feeling because you just think, well, okay, that was painted to sell. It has sold. I've done that. Mm -hmm. But of course that only qualifies you to go on and paint something else because you're only as good as your last work and you're only as effective as your last sale. So how does an artist work on continually improving um i think that's one of the things that i've taken from my military career to be honest because in the military you're constantly criticizing each other um, mm -hmm. not unpleasantly but debriefing all the time to work out what you did what mistakes you made how you could have done it better mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that i do all the time with me quite often i'll produce a finished work and i'll show it to sharon and i'll sort of say what do you think of that and she says oh, i really like that but then i'll sort of say Mm. do you think I've got that C right? Do you think I've got enough light in there? And she'll say, roll her eyes and, well, for heaven's sake. But of course, what I'm doing there is I'm criticizing myself all the time. And you've got to be your own harshest critic, not to destroy your confidence, but just to think, okay, I've learned from that. Next time I'm going to do better. What is it that you enjoy most about your art? Well, these days I enjoy being able to do it um, together as a pair, um, you know, and Sharon and I go out and we spend basically all our working time together, um, which I guess wouldn't work for everybody, but it does work for us. Um, and uh, so the chance to do all this together and talk about the same things all the time um, really works well. Um, in terms of the actual painting side of things like that, um, I do get a huge kick out of each painting. Um, and sometimes even when you're actually doing the brushwork and you see something jump out at you and it's that point by the way that you have to say right leave it don't mm -hmm. touch it again that's what you want but at that point you do get a, I, I continue to get a big kick out of that kind of thing and on the other side what are the most difficult parts for you Difficult parts are sometimes, um, as I mentioned before, trying to get behind a piece of work that you might need to do um, from a commission point of view. Um, because until you really feel that piece of work, I don't really want to put anything on paper at that stage. I mean, I can sketch it because that will help, but I don't want to start any form of painting until I feel that, yeah, I'm really behind this. I understand what I'm trying to do. I understand what the client may want. Um, and how they feel about it. And once I can share that, I can go. But sometimes that's, that's, that's quite hard work and you've got to concentrate on it. Are there any common public misconceptions about artists that people think it is one way, but when you actually live a life of an artist, it's different? I would say um, the one that I would think is that, um, you know, you don't flounce around in a floppy hat um, <laughs> just painting stuff all the time, um, slicing off your ears and so on. You know, you don't, you don't do that. Um, most, most of the artists that I know are very level-headed people mm -hmm. um, who go about their business with serious intent to create, um, you know, pieces of work that they want to create. Um, so I guess there's a misconception there. 
Um, I guess you might also think that you don't have to work very hard at this kind of stuff, but actually a painting is quite hard work. Whether it's very detailed or not whether it really doesn't matter, but the actual act of creation sometimes, as I mentioned before, can leave you really quite quite exhausted at the end of it. Mm -hmm. At this moment, what is the most important thing for you work-wise or art-wise right now? Right now is to um, continue the business along the path that it's uh, on at the moment, which we do have a, um, a great following, and I don't want to let those people down. There's a lot of people out there who um, enjoy seeing the work, whether it's around this local area or whether it's further afield, seeing it on the internet and so on. I don't want to let those people down. Um, we don't want to let those people down, so we want to keep making sure that we produce good quality work um, mm -hmm turning that into print where it's appropriate um, and uh, getting out there and putting it in front of the public. So it's in a way that's more of the same, but more of the same is where we're at because it's important to do. What is the process then of creating good quality work? There's a lot that goes into um, that, that quality of work. I mean, first of all, you need the inspiration because I'm a big fan of the fact that if, you, if you're not inspired, if you don't, I keep saying it, get behind that work, mm -hmm. it's not going to necessarily turn mm -hmm. out so well. You need some soul and part of yourself in it. Um, on the more workaday level, um, you obviously need to find the right scene. Um, and once you've got that scene, you then need to arrange it in the way that you want it because composition is really key um, and this is one of the things that not everybody appreciates but we need to make sure that the, the, the painting is going to be arranged on the paper in an eye-pleasing manner and that sometimes means moving stuff if that mountain's inconveniently placed well you can move it and that's one of the beauties of painting if you don't want that lamppost in there the lamppost comes out mm -hmm. and you can't necessarily do that with photography at least mm -hmm. not without Photoshop yeah. um, but that sort of thing is important. And then, of course, it's a, a, a case of applying the techniques that you know, hopefully, how to use to turn that into a nice painting. And, you know, the, the main thing for a watercolour painting and the one thing that I really always want to include in a painting is light. Um, and I know, <laughs> I know that artists always um, go on about light, but it's so important. You know, if you create a dark, dingy painting, no one's going to like it and I won't like it. So working at that light all the way through is really important. How do you paint water? Well, that will depend on how much... Um, to a certain extent, I think it's important to really sort of like understand what... <laughs> it sounds pretentious, but what the physics is. Um, in that some light will be reflected off water, mm -hmm. some will be transmitted through the water. Um, and of course, everything is illuminated, no matter what it is, water or otherwise, everything that you see is illuminated by the sky. Mm -hmm. So obviously the colours of the sky are going to um, mean that the colours of the water will be in a certain range. Um, and then what you have to do is to try and make sure that you leave, because in watercolour, if you want a white, you don't paint white, you just leave white paper. So all the way through the painting process, when you see a bit of white in a painting, it's been left. It's been deliberately left. It's just pure white paper. Um, and obviously on water, you will generally have those fluid sparkle marks. Mm -hmm. And so painting around those is really important to keep the brightness of the water as well. And obviously with uh, in an area like this, we get a lot of breakers too. And those breakers will generally be white. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's not always white. You've got shadow on them as well. So you have to consider that too. But the main thing, <laughs> and I do have um, a few students that um, um, have come to me for you know lessons in painting over over the last few years, and what I say to them is, don't try too hard. If you try too hard with water, you'll get it too detailed, and it almost becomes like a frozen photograph. Mm -hmm. And you don't want a frozen photograph because it has no movement. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep that life and that vivacity in the water. So not trying too hard. It sounds strange, but it, it actually is a useful thing to remember. Mm -hmm. Is it interesting for you to be self-taught and then to be able to take that skill and to teach others? Yeah, I mean, I've, um, 
I actually enjoy teaching. Um, I used to be um, a flying instructor in the Air Force for much of my career. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I left the Air Force, I initially retrained as a driving instructor. So mm-hmm. you can you can see where I'm going with that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I do enjoy it. Uh, it's nice to take people who really want to. And it's one of the beauties about teaching something like art is that you generally don't have to teach people that don't want to really learn. So they're very attentive. They want to improve. And, uh, you know, they're grateful for whatever you can give them usually. So, yeah, it's an enjoyable process um, and one that I, 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 I thoroughly like doing. Um, and when you see somebody come along from, you know, didn't know how to hold a brush to producing mm-hmm. a piece of nice work, which can happen remarkably quickly, um, I think that's great. Are there ever any wild challenges like people come to you and have apparently no talent but would like to paint? Um, the, the, the talent levels certainly vary. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever had, um, because I haven't had a great many students, mm-hmm. um, but I don't think I've ever had anybody who was, um, you know, really lacking in talent. But the, the, the talent levels vary, but I prefer to think of it as the strengths vary, because if, if you haven't got a talent for the way that you use the brush, you've probably got a talent by, for the way you see the scene. Mm-hmm. And I think the secret is to look out that talent um, and try and concentrate and build from there. Um, I don't think anybody is, you know, particularly talent free. They just might have strengths that you haven't seen. Mm. That's a great answer. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. With art, is it easy or difficult to find a place to exhibit, especially within this region? Yeah, I mean, we... uh we don't necessarily do much in the way of physical exhibition. Partly that comes from the fact that we do a lot of mail order work. You know, people order from all around the world or through the website, um, and we will either courier or post work out to them. Um, we do do some local exhibition in terms of shops more than uh, and smaller galleries where our prints are available. Um, but what we don't tend to do. We do a, a little bit, a little bit more now because we've we've moved into offering framed work direct from us for the prints. We can offer frames for the small and the large prints that we produce. Um, but generally, we'll leave the prints mounted in their white surrounds, but then wrapped in plastic, and mm-hmm. they're available for people to pick up and look at. Um, but we we only in a few cases actually put them in frames on the wall. Um, and my original work never does that. Um, we sell it all through the website. But as you've probably seen at the moment, um, I only have one original painting which is for sale despite all my efforts mm-hmm. <laughs> at increasing that number because I'm, I'm very fortunate. People like the work and, and it tends to sell. Is there anything within art that you haven't done yet but that you would like to do in the future? Ah, uh, in terms of the um, the stuff that I do, um, one of the, the the one that really springs to mind to me at the moment is that um, most of my work is coastal or lowland. Um, I have done the odd mountain scene, but I didn't do a great deal of that. And we only an hour to the south of us, we've got some fantastic mountains, which I'm really very keen to get up into. Um, and what I need to do is to actually get my boots on a bit more head down to those mountains and get up there and start painting snow and rocks and mountain scenes because that's, it's a beautiful, a beautiful sight and I want to get into that. Mm. What kind of art inspires you? Obviously, um, the sort of thing that inspires me most is probably something similar to what I do. I like watercolour. That's the reason that I'm a watercolour painter is that I like watercolours. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed a lot of looking at various people. And around the world at the moment, there are some absolutely fantastic watercolorists that I just can't wait for them to paint the next one, and I can see what they've done, and that's great. Um, In terms of uh, other things that motivate and so on, um, I mean, I like some of the older masters as well. Um, And interestingly, I like Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. and And you might, if you look at my work and you look at Van Gogh, you might not think that I would. But I do, because it just brings a complete um, different viewpoint to his paintings than I have. Um, And especially some of the later ones where he became a little bit more abstract and so Mm -hmm. on. Um, Some of that stuff just speaks to me about how I could do things differently. And I find that very inspiring. Mm. How does it feel when you know that you've finished a painting and you step back from it and you look at it? 
if you think you've done a good job on that painting, um, and obviously every painting is the best job that I can do, um, if you feel good about it, it really is a nice feeling because you step back and you say, do you know what, that's really what I wanted to portray. Some some artists prefer to kind of... what or what we call taking a line for a walk, you know, start somewhere on the paper and just see where this thing develops. Um, I work kind of the other way around in that I won't start a painting until I think I can see it. I can see what I want in my head before anything else happens. And once I get to that stage, after that it's almost just copying because I'm trying to make the image on the paper look like the image in my head. So if it turns out you're looking like that, or perhaps hopefully even better than... That's real satisfaction. Mm. Now, I was doing a little bit of research, and I was reading your blog on your Uh-oh. website, which uh, is uh, very nicely written. Um, Thank you. The parts that I read. And I picked up a few pieces of text or quotes. I'd like to ask you a little bit more about them, or maybe to explain a little bit more. Sure. So... You wrote that a favorite spot of yours is Lossy Mouth, and I've heard a lot of artists talk about this area as an area they like. So what is special about this area? I mean, uh, this area of the coast, um, I, I presume you mean, rather yeah. than uh, further along. Well, um, I mean, one of the nice things about it is it's obviously a beautiful beach, this curve of beach. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's one of the places around here that you can really see just the, 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 the dunes behind the beach, which I'd like to say are purely natural, but of course they're not. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, the, the dunes are beautiful, leading down to a nice clear stretch of, um, uh, of sand, mm-hmm. which has got a beautiful colour to it. There's this reddish tinge to all the rock and therefore the sand around here which is actually quite hard to capture um and then against that you've got this beautiful contrast with the white breakers um and you know add that to a little bit of the stonework and the woodwork which surrounds the harbor and the quayside here and uh, you know the old bridge and so on i mean what's not to like it's it's lovely another quote after the long winter months and the changeable weather of spring, it's great to get out again painting on sight. This is my favourite way of painting, my only reference being what I see. It's also a relaxing way. How do the seasons affect the artist? On the physical sense, um, obviously when it's very cold, it's very cold. Um, Working um, on a large piece of paper in any kind of wind or in rain Um, is almost impossible because watercolour by its very definition dissolves in water. Um, It doesn't mean to say that I don't do it because I'm Mm -hmm. stupid like that. Um, But you can go out and as long as the the painting's not going to be for sale, you can actually go out and still capture stuff in the rain. And when you get back, you're going to have to turn it into something, you know, presentable. But you can do that. Um, I tend to find these days that um, when it gets very cold... Um, I tend to struggle with my fingers and uh-huh. keeping my fingers going. It's an age thing. Um, so that becomes a little bit difficult. And quite often you'll see sketches of mine where I start out top left looking reasonably good. And by the bottom here, it looks like I've been painting with a <laughs> pencil between my toes. Um, and that's simply because I've got colder as I went <laughs> along. Um, there's another limitation um, on watercolour because um, I mean, the coldest I've ever painted a watercolour as, as we say, on plain air, which is the French term for outside, mm-hmm. um, the, uh, is about minus two. And to, to, at that temperature, of course, if you use just pure water, the water will freeze as it goes onto the paintings, form little crystals and ruin your painting. Mm-hmm. And actually what you can do about that is to drop a little bit of gin in the water and it acts as antifreeze. Oh, wow. It's purely for the water, honest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It acts as antifreeze and you can paint. But again, when it's cold and when it's damp, the paper dries so slowly that you often have to wait for such a long time it becomes impractical. So obviously, painting outside, it's best done when there's not, when there's a bit of sunshine. It, it livens the view up. It makes you feel better. Um, and that's when it's really good fun. So yeah, it's nice when spring comes and the weather becomes beautiful. You can get out there and do some painting from life. And you should always carry some gin in your toolkit. Oh, it uh, goes without saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, next, quote, I want 
to make you feel intimate with the landscape, that you could reach out and touch the tree, hear the water, and feel the crisp morning air. How do you manage to achieve that? I think the most important thing of that is to think about what makes you feel all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if you get um, a crisp spring morning, you'll generally get, um, you know, a duck egg blue sky. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll get quite crisp colours and quite mm-hmm. crisp lines wherever you look. And it's that crispness that makes you think, yeah, that looks really nice. And if you dot that with a little bit of white tinge, you can get frosty effect. And that really takes you there. So... To a certain extent, all of this is about techniques. And as you build your stock of paintings up, as you carry on through life as an artist, you'll develop techniques that you know can produce a particular effect. But to get the feeling, you've got to get behind it and then use those techniques in a thoughtful way to say, I want you to feel how crisp the air is. Look how far I can see. Look how clear that horizon is because this is a really clear day. And if you start feeling and thinking like that, that will go through into your work. It's almost like feelings come out of the end of your paintbrush. Yeah, I mean, they come out of the end of the paintbrush, but it's almost like an automatic extension of what's going on in your head because the painting is created in your head. The brushwork is a technique. Mm -hmm. Um, The actual painting and the things that you want to portray, it's all there in my head. And I I go back to saying that, you know, I I like when I see a picture or when I see a view, I'll start by thinking, what is it about that view that I really like? What is it that I want to say about this picture? And once you've decided that, you can work out how you're going to do it. And mostly this happens in my head and I'll produce little thumbnail sketches, which are like literally just little scribbles. But it's speaking to me about where I want this particular emphasis or where do I want the light placed here. And once you've got through all of that, you can almost see the painting in your head. And then it's a question of getting it down on paper spontaneously, quickly with lots of life. And of course, light. That makes me think about, for some reason, the development of technology and i'm wondering if that has made it easier or more difficult to produce the art i think in terms of the um the painting i mean my technique hasn't really changed in a hundred years um and and of course probably more because i use the old-fashioned view of i get myself on site usually i like to work out what i like about something and then I'll paint it. And generally, that involves a lot of walking around on site before you ever settle down to do a painting. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing worse than coming up with what you think is the great definitive painting of this particular place. And then somebody says, yeah, that's okay. Um, If you'd gone around the corner, you can see that mountain. So (laughs) it's a shame. So it's important to make sure that you actually get there. And I, I like to feel the place. Quite often, I'll visit a place more than once doing sketch work and so on before I ever go close to painting it. So that in this sense in itself is old, old fashioned. Um, however, from a business point of view, I mean, what's not everybody is in the market for original paintings, which by their nature need to be a little bit more, you know, expensive. Mm-hmm. I mean, hopefully affordable. Um, I'm very proud to think that we've got a range of affordable paintings and prints, but what brings it to a larger number of people are prints. Um, which we've got into quite a lot and we have a big range of affordable prints and so on that we can push out there so that people can see the same thing as the painting or as close as I can make it. And in terms of making those prints, which we do all ourselves, Mm -hmm. the Gicle printer, which we have, which is a printer which prints in pigment rather than dye-based ink. So effectively you're printing in paint, which means that it will last for as long as a painting will and not fade. Um, the scanners that I use to produce the images that you see on the internet and then on the prints and so on. And of course, computers, which I use to process it so that the prints look just like the original. So that sort of stuff has made things a lot easier. Yeah, again, makes perfect sense. Another quote, colour is a complex subject and I put a lot of work into ensuring my colours have the right degree of warmth and contrast with their neighbours but not everybody wants color. So what's better from your perspective, color or black and white? They both have merit. Mm -hmm. Um, From my point of view as a watercolorist, Mm -hmm. 
I like color. Yeah. Um, and I work hard at producing color. And a lot of people wonder about what I mean about color temperature and so on, you know, when I talk about warmth and so on. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it being in, in simple terms, you know, you want to put like um, a gold red color in a room you want to be warm. Whereas you might want to have something like blue in the bathroom where warmth isn't as important. Um, so there are colors that are warm and there are colors that are cool. From my point of view, it's not only based on making a pretty picture like that, but using um, color to create depth in the painting because warm colors bring something forward and cool colors push it back. For example, if you look at um, one of the works of Turner, who used to be uh, famous as a sea artist, you'll very often see this stormy sea with blues and greens in the background. But then right up front will be a sea boy in bright red. Mm -hmm. And what he's done there is created this huge amount of depth between the cool colors going back and this warm color coming forward. So in those terms, color is really useful um, because it's another tool in your toolbox that you can use to bring a painting to look like the real thing, even though it is a two-dimensional illusion of three dimensions. So it's important to work on that. Um, but equally as well, colour just creates for a nice scene. And actually brings me to one of the things that I'm, I'm, I, my biggest regrets mm -hmm. is that I love doing snow scenes. And snow scenes are just fantastic. For an artist, they're wonderful. The colours in the shadows, um, the colours in the actual air and so on, and that feeling of Christmas, sometimes you can get crispness, not Christmas. <laughs> um, <clears throat> It's absolutely terrific. You can model the land with the shadows. Um, it's great fun. But unfortunately, the whiteness and the coldness of the colours, mm. people don't want to buy it. It's interesting. And so I tend not to paint snow scenes. But I love it when I do. Perhaps there's a market for snow scenes in warm countries. And <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> and vice versa. Um a planned painting versus a spontaneous painting, uh, which is, you know, which is your preference? In an ideal world, a spontaneous painting, um, because, you know, I've, I've stopped here. Wow, that's fantastic. Get it down on paper. When that works, it doesn't get better than that. Um, what tends to happen, though, is that um, with watercolour, you can only get a certain level of detail and so on into a painting uh, before the light runs out or, you know, the day's gone or whatever. So what I tend to like to do when I paint outside is I'll take it out there and I'll capture the colours and the broad brush part of it. And then I'll take it back to the studio and finish it off from there. Um, add a little bit of detail based on my sketch work and so on, because I don't like to work from photos if I can avoid it. Um, so that works very well. Sometimes, though, of course, you actually have to do it in the studio, but I never like to think of as a work having started and finished in a studio. It starts on site, and that's the way I normally, to be honest, work, is I go out and I sketch pencil sketches, lots of notes to myself about what colours, what pigments I'd use and so on and then get back inside. So I don't like to think, even though, I, as I said before, I like to be able to see your work in my head before I start painting it, you've always got to try and make sure that you still keep the things that motivated you, the spontaneity of that, wow, look at that light. And that's got to come through in the painting. From your experience, what advice would you give to young people who are interested in getting into art or painting or following a similar path? I would say that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great to do art. Um, the, the world can't be all artists. Um, art is a much more, it should start as a personal thing, something you want to do, something you feel driven to do. It's not really just a career choice that you might want to make. But if that's really your direction, then, you know, go for it, work hard at it. Um, do go out and uh, study it, uh, get qualifications in it, because that sort of thing will give you the practice and the expertise and you can get some great teachers um, who can really inspire and work on you. Um, however, do bear in mind that um, for every artist that tries to go this route, there's probably another artist who didn't quite make the sales and found that it wasn't sustainable. So it's kind of high risk. Um, and I would say you've got to have a backup option. Um, but if you really want to do it, then 
by all means, go for it. And what could the community do more to support artists locally? I think the nice thing is, you know, if there's, a, if there's an exhibition on, go and see it, you know, and go and try and appreciate what the artist has tried to do and uh, what, they're, what they're trying to show you, what they're trying to say to you in, in, in lyrical terms. Um, because you don't need an education for that. Everybody responds in some way to a picture. Um, and it's great for an artist. There's nothing worse than going to all the work. And believe me, there's a lot of work putting on an exhibition, be it a solo exhibition, a group exhibition, or even as a, you know, a, a, as a society. Go to all that work, and then people don't come. So mm. go out and see it. Um, try and appreciate it. Um, and just enjoy it. And that's probably the best thing that you can do. After that, if it's an entirely a personal decision, if you want to buy anything or anything like that, but the main thing is just go out there and try and enjoy it. Agreed. In terms of influence and recommendations, what books should everybody read? Now, that is a good question. Do you mean purely on art or in any way? Well, you can... Take it any way you want. It can be in the artistic sphere or it can be in general. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of reading. Um, and, uh, you know, all our family is a big fan of reading. Um, there's, there is fictional stuff, which is great because it teaches you, to, it teaches you about stories and so mm -hmm. on, about the way that the language is used. Um, for me, my favourite is um, reading about informative books. You know, I, I, I tend to go the non-fiction route wherever I can. I have a huge interest in space, as you might have seen. I've got a couple of space paintings on, uh, on, on my website. Um, and particularly how, sorry, how do you paint space? After just I curious. tend to, I, well, I paint the Earth-based <laughs> version of rocket launches and so on. Um, you can paint space, and I have done in the past using black paper and using oh. lighter colours on top of that. Um, and that's actually a very interesting um, thing to do. do. Do you have to stretch the paper as well, the same as the white the white paper, or is that it depends what, what what you're putting on it. Um, okay. If you're painting, you couldn't you couldn't do watercolor like that because watercolor is transparent, um, right. and right. therefore whatever color you put on the paper would still be black. Okay, so my question was a bit silly, right? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> because if you use um, acrylic based paints. Um, they are opaque and they will keep their brightness against right. a black background. And okay. that's what I did. Um, and you can spatter using paint just off a nail brush or mm. a toothbrush, mm. which is a perfectly valid technique and one that I use in watercolour as well, mm. um, to spatter paint across the paper, which mm. will dry looking like stars. Oh, um, wow. You can use, um, back in the day, I used to use an airbrush to look like nebula and so on. So mm. you can do that. But in watercolour, I've always painted daylight launch scenes. Um, in particular, um, Falcon Heavy Launch, um, uh -huh. which is one that uh, I put prominently on the website because I really quite enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, and then there's probably not that many watercolours of rocket launches. No, it is sort of like usually regarded as an unusual yeah. subject. Uh, aviation is too. I usually express it that I'm the only person stupid enough to be doing aviation painting in watercolour because it's quite hard to get the detail that most people would want to see. And yet you managed to make it look very simple and it's not, which is a sign of a great artist, I think, personally. I think that's what people like. It's like um, generally you will find that um, if you're viewing anything, the fact that it seemed to be made to look easy... You know, you, could, you just look at a, a comedian on stage. Um, you know, if he's, he or she is good, you'll be thinking, they're just talking. And they're so funny. And it looks easy. Of course it's not. But people are drawn to that. As an artist, is there any music that you use to influence your work? I have very wide musical tastes, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I generally, um, unlike a lot of people, I don't particularly like to work with music. Um, I prefer to work in silence. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that my studio is actually part of my house means that generally I can't work in silence. <laughs> um, and uh, Sharon does not like it to be silent. Yeah. <laughs> so generally there's a compromise and we'll have something playing at the same time. Mm -hmm. But given my choice, I would have it quiet um, and I could just whistle to myself but in terms of the music um 
what I would normally say is that um, I wouldn't be listening to classical music. Um, I would be listening to something that I was just enjoying. Mm -hmm. um, and some pop music, which is popping away in the background, and I can pop away in front mm -hmm. of my painting, and that keeps mm -hmm. me happy. Mm. On an abstract level, time travel is possible. Where would you go and why? Wow, okay. I would go back to visit Sir Isaac Newton, mm -hmm. an absolute hero of mine, um, probably the greatest physicist ever. Um, my degree was in physics. I read about physics. I love physics. Um, and to meet Sir Isaac Newton, even though by all accounts he wasn't a particularly friendly chap, mm -hmm. um, I think would have been fantastic. Your studio is on fire. You can only grab one thing as you rush out the door. What do you pick up? My family. The right. rest, the rest will cope. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, assuming that your family were perfectly safe. Okay. Um, whatever finished work I had there, mm -hmm. I can replace everything else. But the finished work is not um, yeah. irreplaceable. I mean, I could paint another picture. I mean, I don't have that many originals at home, mm -hmm. because as I say, I only have one for sale at the moment, and we only have two or three dotted around the house. Um, one in my studio. I would take that. Um, the rest I can always replace. If you can project yourself into the future and look back, what kind of legacy do you think your art will leave to people? I think that... Um, I, I don't think anybody's going to look back on me as one of the great masters because there's an awful lot of people doing um, greater work in that respect, you know, and more cutting-edge work, if you like. Um but what I think that my legacy would be is a lot of paintings that mean a lot to people hanging on the walls and being loved. Um, and prints, of course, but, you know, I'm thinking, you know, dear to my heart are my originals. Um, they are hanging on walls all around the world. Um, I'm intensely proud of that. Um, and if people look at those paintings on a daily basis and think, oh, then that's great. That's my legacy. How can people contact you or find out more about your work? Well, the best place is through our website, um, and that's at uh, www.robwigganwatercolors.com. Um, or if you just Google Rob Wigan, um, you will usually find me. And uh, there's quite a lot out there that uh, I've put on the internet and so on. That's the best way to do it. Um, we're always very happy, Sharon and I, to receive anybody who wants to look at prints at our house mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we can provide the address. Um, there's a contact me page through the website um, and any of my business cards or the back of the prints that we put mm -hmm. out there have got all our contact details on. So we're actually pretty easy to contact. Are there any social media sites where people can reach you? Yeah, again, if you look at Rob Wigan Watercolours, um, you'll find me there, or just Rob Wigan. And Sharon runs her own uh, page that's uh, Sharon Wigan Prints, um, because obviously that's her uh, neck of the woods. She does she deals mainly in the prints. So she runs that page, and uh, we, we complement each other's work. I tend to have more of a uh, originals focus. Her focus is the prints. Super cool. So anybody listening out there, take a look at the website or have a look at the uh, social media platforms and check out the work because it is absolutely fascinating. And I should also mention that you can uh, you can also see some of the work in the flesh at the various uh, little shops and galleries mm -hmm. um, around both at, um, in think places like Hope and Harbour mm -hmm. um, and uh, in uh, South Street at Crafted and Elgin and so on has got a good selection. So they are spread around around the shops. Mm -hmm. Keep an eye out for them for sure. Rob, thank you very much for finding time to come in here this morning. Yeah, it's I been a pleasure. I, I really appreciate it. I wish you great success with your work and your art in the future. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll get a chance to sit down again at some point in time. I hope so too. Thanks, G. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Made in Mari is a product of the Academy of Language Therapy and Life Coaching. Book a free online personal or professional development consultation today. What are you waiting for?